There are a lot of very measurable ways that one can be considered strong in the Naruto universe. You can be an Otsutsuki, you can be one of the Gokage, you can be the most talented sage the world has ever known. All of these are different avenues in which somebody can follow to become strong. And that's kind of the beauty of a world with a vast and complex power system. And while unfortunately at the very tip top of power towards the end of Shippuden, it seemed the only way to become the strongest person was to have the biggest chakra mech, as people like Kakashi, Madara, Sasuke, and even Naruto all eventually just became chakra mech pilots, Kishimoto, the author of Naruto, actually didn't like this. So Kishimoto identified at the end of Shippuden that the scale of Naruto, a show originally about ninjas, had gotten way too large, and thus Kishimoto was resolved to reel in the scale for his next series. Boruto. Now, this is actually why people believe that Boruto is a weaker universe, because people like Naruto and Sasuke rarely use their big old chakra mech moves, and they're the only people who still have the chakra mech moves. And even when they do use the chakra mech moves, people like Ishiki embarrass the chakra mechs. But this is kind of Kishimoto signaling to us at least that the era of chakra mechs is over, and that instead of these massive flashy moves, we're gonna focus on the things that made this show great in the beginning hand-to-hand -hand combat. See, say what you will about Naruto. One thing is undeniable. When it comes to fight choreography, and more importantly, hand-to-hand -hand fight choreography, it has some of the greatest fights of all time. And while obviously fights that come down the line that feature grand scale and entire tailed beasts are also incredible, if you sit down any Naruto fan and ask them genuinely, what is your favorite Naruto fight of all time? I'd say there's about an 85% chance they answer with one of these three fights. And that would be either Naruto and Sasuke's first fight, Naruto and Sasuke's second fight, or Obito and Kakashi's fight. And while Naruto and Sasuke's second fight definitely does have some big old chakra mech moments, the real reason that Naruto and Sasuke's second fight is so incredible is because of the gripping hand-to-hand. -hand. And thus, just like that, Boruto has reintroduced the importance of taijutsu. Ironically, the simplest and most easily copied thing from Naruto is the thing that sets it apart from all other anime. And the era of incredible hand-to-hand -hand fights did not die with Naruto. In fact, some of, if not the greatest fights in the entirety of the Naruto universe happen within the confines of Boruto, especially as it pertains to Taijutsu. So now the Taijutsu is once again rising in prevalence in the Naruto universe, whether that be because Kishimoto wants the story to go back to throwing hands, or because enemies now in Boruto either have karma markings or Rinnegan that make ninjutsu all but irrelevant, I figured there was no better time to talk about taijutsu, but specifically about those who use it. Because today, ladies and gentlemen, I wanna to talk to you about the top 10 taijutsu users in Naruto, ranked and explained. And trust me, there'll be some entries on this list that surprise you. But before we get to ranking or explaining anything, guys, please, for me, like this video, subscribe to the page, and hit that noti bell. And if you guys like the idea of me talking about which anime characters throw the best hands, you're gonna love my other channel, The Weeb Commander, where instead of talking about Naruto and Borto, I talk all other anime. Or if you wanna see me get close to throwing hands with somebody else, go ahead and follow my anime podcast, where me and Danny Mata break down everything that happened in anime this week. It's called Otaku's Anonymous, and it's available on YouTube, Spotify, and Apple Podcasts. Or if you just wanna look like somebody who will throw hands over anime, guys, go ahead and meander into my anime store, Otaku's Anonymous.net, where you can pick up some of the greatest anime merch known to man, like this Madara and Donzo political team. But before we get into all that, today we're going to talk about this video's sponsor. See, it's winter time. The days are getting colder and shorter, which means it's time to snuggle up in your living room with the mobile game you love. And that's roughly how my winter's been going, as I've found a mobile game that's available on both mobile and PC that I've been stuck into for months. And see, the beauty of this mobile game being available on PC and mobile is that I can play it wherever and whenever I want to, because my account seamlessly transfers between the two, so my progress always keeps up with me. In this game, there are over 800 champions, ranging everywhere from elves to orcs to demons. So if you're into games with an insane amount of playable characters that allow you to play however you want to, then boy oh boy, I got a game for you. And to play that game with me, all you have to do is click the link in my description or scan the QR code on the screen right now. And that game, as some of you might have already guessed, is Raid Shadow Legends, which just received some massive and 
super fun updates, like the Christmas Story event, which started on December 15th, which is a special holiday themed event that allows you to follow Sir Nicholas, one of the champions, through a festive story in which you play mini games that allow you to either win in universe or real life prizes, ranging from epic and legendary champions to Amazon gift cards. All you need to do to join the event is go to raidxmas.com. That's R A I D X M A S.com. It also just added the Cursed City. It's one of Raid's biggest features since the Doom Tower, with 100 stages to complete, including stages where you'll need to take down two of Raid's bosses at the same time. There are also tons of other themed events, tournaments, summon boosts, and other surprises, with a month long Yuletide Titan event that can win you awesome prizes. So go check out Raid this holiday season. So if you haven't started playing yet, what are you waiting for? Click the link in my description or scan the QR code on my screen and get insane bonuses only available via my link. Like two epic champions, the first being Light Swarm, a very strong epic champion from the Sacred Order, and the second epic champion being Juliana, a boss killer also from the Sacred Order. And once you're in game, find me under NC Hammer 23 and join my clan called the Hammerheads. Hit my link. I'll see you on the battlefield. So Taijutsu, the base of all abilities in Naruto. Sure, you can have giant fireballs. Sure, you can play with people's senses to make them see things that aren't there. But when it really comes down to it, if you aren't able to throw them knuckles, you're not gonna be a strong ninja. And this has been proven over and over and over again, with people like Gara, an incredibly talented ninjutsu specialist being shown up by somebody who only has the ability to use taijutsu. And while obviously in the end, genius does prevail over the taijutsu ability of Rock Lee, it's moments like this in Naruto that show us, no matter how far you push your ninjutsu or your genjutsu, if you're not able to fight up close, you will die on the battlefield. And never, and I mean never, has that been more true than now in Boruto. See, because Boruto, from the very beginning, has not been about Chakramex or Susanos or even tailed beasts. In fact, all of the things that at one time made you powerful in Naruto have pretty much all but been forgotten. Now what makes you powerful are things like a karma marking or shinobi wear, things that just boost your inherent speed and power, essentially just making you a better taijutsu user. And even now, with Boruto's newest move being released, the Rasengan Uzuhiko, it's simply a Rasengan that surrounds his body, acting as a defensive and offensive ability. However, in order for him to use that ability in either means, he has to get up close and personal with the person he's trying to take out. So whether you like it or not, Taijutsu is back, and Naruto will not be coming Dragon Ball anytime soon. So for focusing on these hands, let's get to focusing on who's the best at them. Now, we're not going to be talking about current day Boruto here, because a lot of people have taken a step back power-wise, and a couple of people on this list, they're just dead. So we're more going to be looking all time. Also, I'm keeping all Otsutsis off this list because genuinely that's boring. Like yeah, obviously Momoshiki and Ishiki are incredible at Taijutsu. They're also basically gods. You wanna know who else was really good at Taijutsu? Probably Kaguya and Hagoromo. Oh, and Kinshiki and Orushiki and Toneri. But now that we got the rules out of the way, let's get to our number 10 spot because coming in last place, is Neji. Yes, I'm aware that Neji doesn't accomplish all that much when it comes to Naruto's overarching storyline. However, when it comes to straight up Taijutsu genius, he's almost unrivaled. See, Neji was a member of the Hyuga's side branch family, meaning like all other members of the side branch family, he wore a curse mark, one that put him under the control of all main branch family members and sealed his Byakugan away should he ever die. Now, because Neji was a member of the side branch family, he wasn't allowed to learn all of the key techniques of the Hyuga family, things that were being taught freely to people like Hinata. However, that never stopped Neji. In fact, it only fueled his fire. As when Neji saw that his father Hayashi was sacrificed for his brother Hayashi, Neji realized that as a member of the side branch family, he would have to make his own way. And thus, Neji, even though he was born a talented Byakugan user, committed himself to become the genius we knew him as. And Neji was able to achieve a level of power that put him among some of the strongest Genin in part one of Naruto. In fact, even as a child, it was stated that he was strong enough to defeat full-grown Hyuga members. And to mind you, the Hyuga clan comprises a large amount of Konoha's military, so it's not like he was fighting scrubs. Now, Neji as a Genin accomplishes a fair amount. In the junior exams, he's able to beat the brakes off Hinata, which isn't saying all that much, and while he does give Naruto a really good fight, unfortunately he runs out of chakra and doesn't see the clone waiting for him underground, and then bing bang boom, Neji's out of the fight. Now does this confirm to us that Naruto at that moment was stronger than Neji? 
I tend to say no, as I believe genuinely at the time of the tuning exams, the only two people stronger than Neji were probably Sasuke and Gara. However, Naruto, Gara, Sasuke, and Neji are kind of in a revolving circle when it comes to the tuning exams and the Sasuke retrieval arc in terms of power in my mind. And this is kind of only corroborated by the fact that Neji is one of the only few people during the Sasuke retrieval arc to wipe out the Sound Village 5 member that they came across. See, obviously, we know that the first one on one in the Sasuke retrieval arc is Choji versus Jiroba, a battle which Choji is able to win, but only after he takes the three tricolored pills, which, for all intents and purposes, should have killed him if not for the intervention of Tsunade. However, the second one on one battle is Neji versus Kitamaru. And while Kitamaru is absolutely a very even matching for Neji, Neji is able to kill him. Now, mind you, Kitamaru is one of the Sound Village Five, capable of opening up to the second level of the curse market, giving Kitamaru spider like abilities on top of the fact that he has a massive spider summon, which can not only battle on its own, but also summon hundreds, if not thousands, of smaller spiders. Kitamaru should be a terrible matchup for Neji, as Kitamaru is a long range attacker, shooting arrows from kilometers away, while Neji is a close quarter combat fighter, relying on the power of his Byakugan and Gentle Fist. However, Neji is able to overcome this disadvantage against Kitamaru by not only using his eight trigrams, 128 palms, to destroy hundreds, if not thousands, of spiders as they're descending down onto him to slow down his rotation ability. Basically, when it comes down to matchups, Kitamaru was an awful matchup for Neji, having an answer for pretty much all of his abilities. And yet, Neji was able to assess the situation and understand that there was a spider web attached to every arrow that Kitamaru fired. And thus, Neji understanding that Kitamaru was aiming for his blind spot allows Kitamaru to hit him in a non-lethal area and sends Gentle Fist through that spider string. And with simply one Gentle Fist attack, Neji is able to kill a level two curse mark user. That's something that doesn't get talked about enough. It was a one shot kill. And while Neji, without medical attention, probably also would have died and this fight would have resulted in a tie, showed in that one moment that his taijutsu was legit. Now, Neji unfortunately kind of disappears from the story after this until the fourth great Shinobi World War. And while Neji doesn't accomplish a whole lot in the fourth great Shinobi World War, except, you know, for having his own Tenketsu points poked, we'll say. Neji does manage with Taijutsu alone, that is to say, Gentle Fist alone, repel one of the tails of the Ten Tails. Now, this is with Neji's vacuum palm. And while it's not like Neji killed the Ten Tails, being able to repel one of the tails of the Ten Tails, an entity which terraformed the Earth, shows that Neji, in the years since the battle against Kitamaru, has definitely been working on his Taijutsu. And thus, while Neji doesn't accomplish nearly as much as anybody else on this list, it's hard to ignore his abilities. So he gets the 10 spot. Coming up at number nine, we have a shared spot. Now, the reason that this spot is shared is because for all intents and purposes, these characters have never really done anything to separate from each other when it comes to Taijutsu. Though I don't believe that these characters are equally strong as each other, as one character is clearly stronger, at least now. And therefore, in a tight spot at number nine, we have Tsunade, and Sakura. Now, someone make the argument that Tsunade's Taijutsu feats are actually more impressive than Sakura's. And I wouldn't really disagree with that. But when it comes down to Taijutsu kit, Tsunade and Sakura kind of have the exact same one. To say that Tsunade or Sakura are skilled Taijutsu users is kind of a stretch. However, if everybody else on this list is a knife, that is to say, if you get hit by it multiple times, you're going down for the big one. Sakura and Tsunade are a shotgun. One shot and you're not getting back up. And therefore, in a practical sense, while it might be easier to avoid the Taijutsu strikes of Sakura or Tsunade, the power behind those strikes mean that if you don't avoid all of them, you're not seeing tomorrow. See, so really the first time that we ever see Tsunade demonstrate any skill when it comes to Taijutsu is her battle against the Rochimaru. And while Tsunade is introduced as one of the forefront Taijutsu users in all of Naruto, in this battle, Orochimaru does have noodle arms. And just kind of realize that most of my arms are under the camera, so me doing this doesn't really do much for you visually. But arms or not, the fact that Tsunade was able to push the offensive against Orochimaru is still impressive. And not to mention in this battle against Orochimaru, we got to see the power that Tsunade was dealing with as she blew holes in walls and crashed down entire castles. And not to mention that at least prior to Kabuto pulling out a little bit of that red juice, she was able to speed blitz somebody who is at least a high Jonin at the moment that Kabuto was battling against Tsunade. And while Kabuto in that moment is probably more focused on his medical ninjutsu, like his chakra scalpel. In order to use chakra scalpel effectively, Kabuto has to have really good taijutsu. So the fact that Tsunade was able to blitz the likes of him shows her speed. But really, when it comes down to it, the most impressive taijutsu feats that Tsunade 
ever pulls off or during the fourth great shinobi world war where Tsunade accomplishes something with one simple kick that Naruto couldn't do with a big ball Rasengan. See, when Tsunade finds herself in combat against the likes of Madara, Tsunade is able to crack his Susanoo ribcage. And while a lot of you are probably going, la di da she cracked her ribcage. In the beginning of the Fourth Great Shinobi World War, when Madara pulls up on the entirety of the Fourth Division, when Naruto and Gara step in to make sure he doesn't kill any more useless ninjas, Naruto surprises Madara with a big ball Rasengan, of which Madara simply blocks with a Susanoo ribcage. And the Susanoo ribcage is completely fine, which tells us that Tsunade, with the power of a simple kick, has more offensive output than Naruto in KCM1 using a big ball Rasengan. And considering the fact that that would be more than enough to kill 99% of people in the Naruto universe, that kind of backs up my whole Tsunade is a shotgun theory. And we haven't even taken into account Tsunade's heavenly kick of pain, which is on multiple bases shown the ability to create massive craters. So she definitely deserves respect. And when it comes to respect, I would reckon that the level of respect that Tsunade deserves is somewhere around the same amount as Sakura deserves. See, we actually have actual stats for every person who currently exists in Boruto in terms of how powerful they are in Boruto. And while Sakura in the third data book only came in at a three out of five in Taijutsu, by the time that Boruto has come around, Sakura's unarmed combat is at a five star rating. Now this doesn't necessarily mean that her Taijutsu is five out of five, but it means that she's in the upper echelon of people at unarmed combat. Now, a lot of that has to do with her ability to regenerate her body, her massive chakra reserves, and her strength. But all of that can very obviously play into Taijutsu ability. And considering the fact that Tsunade did all of the important training for Sakura because Kakashi was too busy pining over Sasuke and maybe running around with my guy, Sakura's Taijutsu fighting style emulates Tsunade's pretty clearly, as Sakura, much in the same way as Tsunade, also has a heavenly kick of pain. However, unfortunately, when it comes down to Sakura's taijutsu feats, most of them come against puppets. Now, the most clear and obvious example here for everybody who's watched Naruto is Sakura versus Sasori. And while a lot of people tend to try and strip this feat away from Sakura because Granny Chiyu was controlled to her via puppet strings, this feat is at least 90% Sakura. See, in this battle, Granny Chiyu isn't technically controlling Sakura. In fact, the reason that Granny Chiyu has puppet strings attached to Sakura is to act as a second set of eyes. See, Granny Chiyu explains to Sakura when they're setting up her going to fight Sasori's puppets that Sakura will retain full control of her body. However, if hypothetically Granny Chiyo sees something that Sakura does it, like an attack from her blind side, Granny Chiyo will be able to move Sakura out of the way. And thus, in this moment, Sakura isn't acting as a puppet. Granny Chiyo is just acting as a spotter. So the majority of the taijutsu we see Sakura use against Sasori's puppets is her own. And considering the fact that Sasori was called Sasori of the Red Sand, the person who killed the third Kaze Kage, said to be the strongest Kaze Kage in history, and Sakura was walking through his puppets like a knife through hot butter, in this moment, Sakura's taijutsu Jutsu ability that she had worked on during the time skip is put on full display. And while yes, technically Sasori's death does come at the hands of Granichio and not Sakura, without Sakura's presence, Granichio would have died about 10 minutes earlier than she planned. And this isn't the only time that Sakura puts on a big show against a bunch of puppets. As in Naruto the Last, Sakura also comes toe to toe with a bunch of puppets. But this time, there's no strings attached to her or the puppets. See, because the Otsutsuki, specifically the Otsutsuki who live on the moon, found a way to create puppets that operate entirely on their own. Meaning, no puppeteer needs to control them, they simply do whatever directive the puppeteer tells them to do. And once again, Sakura absolutely cuts through these puppets like a knife through hot butter. But this time, there's no way for you to take away that feat from her. However, it seems pretty much all but inarguable that these puppets are much stronger than the puppets that she was fighting when she was fighting against Sasori, as these are ancient Otsutsuki puppets that have been mastered to the level where they don't need a puppeteer. And I don't know about you guys, but the idea of one person trying to manage 300 puppets seems a little bit weaker than one puppet who's in charge of themselves. But really, when it comes down to it, Sakura's most impressive taijutsu feats come from her battle against Shin Uchiha. At least, when it comes to fights that have been animated. As I would actually argue that her most impressive taijutsu feats come from her light novel. However, in this battle against Shin Uchiha, Sakura finds herself one-on-one -on -one against the man with like two dozen Sharingan. And mind you, Shin Uchiha isn't using all these Sharingan to rip off a bunch of Izanami or Izanagi like Donzo. No, he's using these Sharingan to see and react and perceive. And on top of that, one of the Sharingan is in MS. Now, I'm not going to sit here and say that Shin Uchiha's extrasensory MS perception is on par with that of Sasuke's, but what I am going to say is that Shin's extrasensory MS perception is probably on par with Sasuke in his battle against Killer B. And that is to say that Shin's extrasensory perception is probably somewhere around 
around being able to manage watching almost eight swords at once against a guy who's been using eight swords his entire life. And that's just one of his eyes. And yet Sakura, without the activation of her Byakuya seal, goes toe-to-toe -to -toe with Shin Uchiha and Taijutsu for a fair amount of time. In fact, giving us one of the most underrated fights in all of Naruto history. And while Sakura probably wouldn't have won this battle without Sasuke stepping in, Shin Uchiha should absolutely not be underestimated as a Taijutsu opponent. And when you combine that with a light novel feat of defeating an Anbu captain with a version 1 Jinjuriki cloak with Taijutsu and her Byakuya seal alone, it's hard to not give her her flowers. All puns intended. So while many would make the argument that Tsunade is better at Taijutsu than Sakura, I would actually go the other way. But in both of their cases, their strength in Taijutsu is largely predicated on the fact that one hit kills you. Enough about them, let's get to our number 8 spot, because coming up at number 8, we have Hinata. Yes, I put Hinata above Neji, and I have a a fair amount of reasons to do so. While Neji was a genius of gentle fist, Hinata simply outmasters him. Hinata has shown the ability to do any and everything that Neji can do. However, during the pain arc, it was also revealed that Hinata had mastered one of the most illustrious abilities of the Hyuga, the Twin Lion Fist. And while she doesn't exactly use that Twin Lion Fist to any avail, Hinata at the age of 15, finding out how to apply shape transformation to her chakra and then still use Gentle Fist is one of the most impressive things we've seen on a Taijutsu basis. Especially when you consider the fact that Twin Lion Fist not only allows Hinata to still use Gentle Fist, but also works a lot like Samehata, in that anytime Hinata makes contact with an opponent with her Twin Lion Fist activated, she steals their chakra, giving her an all but infinite battery when it comes to using her Byakugan or Gentle Fist. And when you consider the fact that she pulled this ability off at 15 and no other Hugo member is able to do it, that's pretty impressive. And while in the fight that Hinata reveals Twin Lion Fist is short and sweet, she does manage to hit Tendo Pain. That's something. And just like Sakura, she also manages to destroy many of Toneri's puppets. On top of this, like her deceased cousin Neji, she's also able to repel the Ten Tails tail. So if we're going to give Neji credit for doing that, we also got to give Hinata credit. But probably the most impressive thing that Hinata ever does, Taijutsu-wise, is destroying the Tensei God. Specifically, Hamura's Tensei God that exists on the moon and acted as a power source to people like Toneri. See, because Hinata, after receiving the last vestiges of Hamura's chakra, is able to upgrade her twin lion fist to destroy the Tensei God. And since the last, unlike all other Naruto movies is canon, this is very much possibly a repeatable feat. But considering the fact that Hinata is very much a side character and a love interest and unfortunately doesn't get any important fights, it's hard to put her really any higher than this. Mostly because I really just couldn't justify putting her over our seventh spot, A and A. That is to say, the third and fourth Raikages. Not the first or second Raikages. They're all named A. Kind of makes you wonder what happened with Darui. And while I'm sure the first and second Raikages were incredible at Taijutsu, we know next to nothing about them except for the fact that the first Raikage was modeled after Jimi Hendrix. So, who knows, maybe he used the same abilities as the Kyoto High Principle. Now, technically, the addition of the third or fourth Raikage on this list is kind of cheating, because while the third and fourth Raikage are incredible at Taijutsu, technically what they use at their highest level of Taijutsu is Nin Taijutsu, a mix of Ninjutsu and Taijutsu, as the third and fourth Raikage don't reach their highest level of Taijutsu until they activate their Lightning Cloak, which increases their defensive ability, speed, and power, as well as their reaction time. So do we give credit to the third and fourth Raikage for using an adaptation of Taijutsu and boosting it with Ninjutsu? Do we dock their Taijutsu ability because it's heavily reliant on the Ninjutsu side of things? I can't really say, but if you were going to talk about Taijutsu ability alone, A and A would probably be higher on this list. Actually, no, I just looked at the rest of the list and no, they wouldn't. So actually, I'm not docking them for using ninjutsu. Game is game. This list is very top-heavy. And while when it comes to the third Raikage, we don't have a ton of feats, we understand that the third Raikage himself was referred to as the Perfect Shield. Now, he got this moniker because he covered the retreat of 10,000 Shinobi during the Third Great Shinobi World War. And because his Lightning Cloak was all but invincible, with really the only thing that was able to punch through it being his hell staff. Now, we know that the third Raikage recovered the treat of his soldiers for three days against 10,000 shinobi. As to how many of the shinobi he killed, we don't know. But considering the fact that none of them were able to get past him, you gotta assume it was a good amount of them. Now, obviously, a large part of this was the fact that the third Raikage had an insane amount of chakra, and thus he could maintain his lightning cloak for a fair amount of time so nobody could stab him. However, on top of this, the third Raikage also had things like his lightning lariat and his hell stab, which is essentially just a chidori that gets more powerful the less fingers you use. And they say size matters. Apparently not. Confirms what I've been hearing for years. And it was the power of this hell stab, the one finger version of which is said to be strong enough to be able to cut through basically anything in the Naruto universe, like the entirety of Giki's tails or his horn, that got A, the third Raikage, through three days of this battle. However, we have substantially more feats for his son, A, the fourth Raikage. Don't name your children after you. Even with the junior thing, just don't. 
Just, it, it's just needlessly confusing. Now, A, the fourth Raikage has a fair amount of very impressive feats. Like the fact while Minato was alive, he was considered the only man fast enough to keep up with him. And while Minato was faster than A, Minato is technically infinitely fast. So even being talked about in the same level of speed as Minato, is a big compliment. And after Minato's death, A was universally agreed upon to be the fastest man on earth. A man so fast he was able to use that speed in a contest of strength against Tsunade and come out victorious, speed blitz and all but embarrass a dual MS Sasuke, and go toe-to-toe -to -toe when it comes to speed with a KCM1 Naruto. Now, KCM2 Naruto, different ballpark. But still, keeping up with KCM1 Naruto, very impressive. And while we never got to see the fourth Raikage go toe-to-toe -to -toe with Gyuki like his father, he was still heavily involved in all battles against Gyuki whenever Gyuki raged out in blue be. And on top of this, the fourth Raikage doesn't use Black Lightning like his father. As we know, the third Raikage passed down Black Lightning explicitly to Darui, which means that any offensive ability that the third Raikage had was actually more heavily dependent on Ninjutsu than A, the fourth Raikage. So I'd argue when it comes to Taijutsu prowess, the fourth Raikage is actually probably stronger than the third. But enough about those two A's, let's talk about a man with three A's in his name, because coming up at number six, we have Gara. Nick, what are you talking about? Gara's entirely focused on using his magnet release. He has no Taijutsu ability whatsoever. And for a while, would that take you would have been correct. In fact, one of Gara's biggest weaknesses in Naruto and Naruto Shippuden was his lack of taijutsu ability. And it's because of this that Rock Lee almost manages to defeat him in the tuning exams. And it's why he was so afraid of Kimaru when Kimaru came back from the dead after the massive sand burial. See, really, when it came down to it for a large amount of Naruto, if you could get close enough to Gara, you could win. That is no longer the case. Sigara, after realizing that his taijutsu is seriously lacking, decides to train with Shira, the user of the Seven Heavenly Breaths, a character who is on par in taijutsu with the likes of Rock Lee. And while technically this battle between Rock Lee and Shira isn't canon, and even Shira training with Gara, at least as it's depicted, isn't canon, as this training session between Shira and Gara is shown during the new tuning exams filler arc, it is kind of technically canon. Like, yes, the scene we get exists in a filler arc, and therefore is filler. However, in canonicity, this scene has been agreed upon to have happened, and it's why Gara is now better at Taijutsu. I know, it's kind of weird, but basically all you need to take from it is that Gara has trained with Shira and is now better at Taijutsu. And we're shown in this training montage that Gara is able to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with a base form Shira pretty equally. And while that would be impressive enough, Gara very clearly continues to train with Shira and Taijutsu, to the point where when Gara finds himself in a battle against Kishiki in Boruto and or the Boruto movie, Kishiki compares Gara's taijutsu to that of Naruto and Sasuke, claiming that his taijutsu is first rate, implying that in the time since we last saw Gara training in taijutsu, he's continued to train. And now somebody with incredibly trained eyes, those being Byakugan, and with an incredible amount of power, I mean this is Kishiki we're talking about, has seen Gara's taijutsu ability and has decided that it is as good as other people he's fought, like Naruto and Sasuke. And while with that comment alone, we could say, oh my God, Gara's one of the best Taijutsu users in the entire universe, I'm not gonna weight that comment too heavily. But the fact that Gara's Taijutsu prowess was acknowledged by Kinshiki, a Taijutsu and Kenjutsu specialist, means he's done a lot of work. And thus, somewhat surprisingly, Gara exists at number six on this list, just below the person he fought in the tuning exams, because coming in at number five, we have Sasuke. Ooh, I can feel it. I can I can feel the comments of hatred. I know. Give me a second. Nick, what do you mean that Sasuke's only one spot better than Gara? You literally just said you were gonna wait that comment too highly. I did say that, and I mean it. And here's the thing. Sasuke is an incredible hand-to-hand -hand fighter. However, Sasuke at his strongest is not a hand-to-hand -hand fighter. He is a swordsman. If you told me I had to fight Sasuke without using Jutsu, I would say no thank you. And when it comes down to battles without using Jutsu, Sasuke is one of your scariest possible opponents. I mean, Sasuke is a wielder of the Sharingan, which means that he can copy physical movements. And we've seen him do this, most notably when he copies Rock Lee's Lion Barrage, or at least that's what he names it. But basically, when Rock Lee hits Sasuke with the primary Lotus, Sasuke goes, oh yeah, I know that now. And that's something he can do over and over and over again. If he watches a good Taijutsu specialist, he now gets to be as good a taijutsu as they are. On top of that, in base form against an amped early version one Naruto with one tail, Sasuke was able to keep up with that version of Naruto in taijutsu. Well, eventually that battle devolved into Sasuke using his curse mark and then using the Onyx Shidori. It did begin as a taijutsu battle where Sasuke was keeping up in his base form with an amped Naruto. And while Sasuke does absolutely get put on a poster by Killer B twice, the fact that he was able to keep track of any of those swords for any amount of time is somewhat impressive. On top of that, Sasuke managed to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with his brother Itachi in Taijutsu, and well, Taijutsu wasn't exactly Itachi's 
forte. Itachi, well, at least 30% of Itachi, was enough to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with the likes of KCM1 Naruto. And obviously, in Naruto and Sasuke's second battle, the most important part of that battle did boil down to Naruto and Sasuke using Taijutsu. And while a lot of that Taijutsu is predicated around the usage of additional ninjutsu additives, well, like Naruto's chakra hands or Sasuke's kagatsuchi, I'll give you a hint. When it comes to Taijutsu, Naruto's pretty high on this list. And maybe the most impressive thing that Sasuke ever pulls off Taijutsu-wise is going toe-to-toe -to -toe against a fused Momoshiki. And while technically the most impressive thing that Sasuke does in this battle is kick Momoshiki in the side of the head in his fused form, and this could mostly be tied into the fact that Momoshiki was currently in a battle against base form Naruto, giving an absolute class on what Taijutsu looks like to Momoshiki, still being able to speed blitz a fused Momoshiki and land a clean hit, Pretty good look. But really, when it comes down to it, Sasuke is more heavily reliant on his sword than he is his fists. And while separating Taijutsu and Kenjutsu is kind of splitting hairs, if we weren't separating Taijutsu from Kenjutsu, Killer B would be on this list. And considering the fact that Darui was put in the same categorization as Gara by Kinshiki, then Darui should be on this list. And so, while I heavily respect Sasuke's hand-to-hand -hand combat ability, he's gotta get docked for the fact that he usually is using a sword, which is Kenjutsu. However, you know who doesn't use a sword, and ironically, Tatsu Sasuke, some of what he knows, well, that would be our number four spot, Kakashi. Kakashi is as much of a taijutsu expert as you get. And Kakashi is a taijutsu expert for a lot of the same reasons that Sasuke is a taijutsu expert. I mean, Kakashi is known as the copy ninja, and while that's usually talking about the fact that he's copied over 1,000 jutsu, taijutsu is still technically jutsu. And therefore, if Sasuke has copied physical movements in taijutsu, then you can bet your bottom dollar, so is Kakashi. And Kakashi has been incredible at taijutsu for pretty much as long as we've known him. See, well, Kakashi is known as the copy ninja of 1,000 jutsu, more often than not, he's just straight up using Taijutsu. And the Jutsu he created, the Chidori, or the Raikiri in his case, is to complement that fact. See, because while Kakashi can absolutely use mid to long range Jutsu, he prefers to use the Chidori, as the Chidori complements his more up close and personal fighting style. Mostly to complement the fighting style that he grew up on, which was reliant on his white chakra saber. However, unlike Sasuke, Kakashi, after the loss of his sword, never really picked one up again. You know, until he got the Executioner Blade for a little bit, which was cool. But really, from the jump, Kakashi has always shown that his hand to hand fighting fighting ability is next to none. In the earliest days of us knowing Kakashi, we saw that Kakashi, as a Genin, was able to pressure the likes of Minato, who, albeit wasn't trying, but still impressive. But the fact that Minato registered Kakashi as the only threat during the bell test is saying something. On top of that, Kakashi has had a ton of fights, as Kakashi in the first arc of Naruto is pretty much the sole person holding it down against Zabuza, and he did the same thing in the battle against Kakazu. And while in these fights, he obviously uses a myriad of different jutsus to control pacing and attack from a long range, but we know when things get up close and personal, no Kakashi is that guy. And this is mostly because he grew up next to Mike Guy, who he sparred with and competed with in every imaginable capacity, which means that he's been able to copy a fair amount from Mike Guy, even going so far as to accidentally awaken the first gate while training during the time skip. And this isn't the only time that Kakashi wandered into accidental comparison with Rock Lee and Mike Guy. As when an OG Naruto, Naruto was talking about Kakashi, he said a bunch of really nice things about him, like how his nose was better than Kiba's and his intellect was higher than Shikamaru's, and that his taijutsu was better than Rock Lee's. Now, mind you, this is the Taijutsu of a Rock Lee that just opened to the fifth gate and battled against Gara on a somewhat equal footing. But none of these, and I mean none of these feats, even come close to scraping Kakashi's most impressive Taijutsu feat. And that would be the feat that he accomplished in one of Naruto's best fights, Kakashi versus Obito. Now, in this battle, a 1MS Kakashi is battling against White Mask Obito, but now an unmasked version of it. And under that mask, it was revealed that not only is half of Obito's body Hashirama cells, which gives him a massive chakra boost, regeneration ability, and the ability to use his MS basically as much as he wants, but also revealed a Rinnegan. And considering Kakashi's track record against guys with Rinnegan, this fight didn't look good for Kakashi. And yet, Kakashi was able to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with essentially the final antagonist of the show on a 100% equal footing. I mean, this is a man with a new set of six paths of pain that are all Jinchuriki, all of the abilities of the Rinnegan, and all of the abilities of Kamui. For all intents and purposes, this should have been the most powerful version of Obito we ever saw, and Kakashi in the Kamui dimension manages to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with him in a 95% Taijutsu battle. Now, you can say what you want about Obito's Taijutsu, and how Kakashi going toe-to-toe -to -toe with Obito's Taijutsu just makes his Taijutsu as good as Obito's, but with strength comes Taijutsu. I think Sakura and Tsunade are testaments to that fact, and at any point, Obito could have used any of the myriad of his abilities to fight Kakashi to a higher level. And a couple of times, he does. And yet Kakashi, once again, through 95% Taijutsu, battles against Obito 
equally. And what's crazy is that one could make the argument that this isn't even Kakashi's most impressive feat, as that version of Kakashi that we saw in the work is actually weaker than the version of Kakashi we have now in Boruto, or at least weaker than Hokage Kakashi was. But considering the fact that the prime age of ninja appears to be somewhere around 50, we might be currently looking at the strongest ever version of Kakashi because his truck pool is no longer hindered by a constantly activated Sharingan. And while Sharingan does technically give you the ability to perceive things faster, it's not like Sharingan makes you faster or stronger. And those are kind of the two biggest things when it comes to Taijutsu. But now, instead of having the extrasensory perception of a Sharingan, Kakashi has replaced that with stamina. And all of this was put on to show when he came toe-to-toe -to -toe with the likes of Kashin Koji, a man who was able to kill Ishiki. Well, 10% Chiken, but still. So when it comes down to talking about who's the best at any form of Jutsu, if you don't have Kakashi somewhat near the top of your list, you're tripping. But the same could absolutely be said for the likes of Madara. Because coming in up at number three, we have Madara. Madara is genuinely the best example of if you're talking about the greatest users of anything, include him. If it's lightning, if it's fire, if it's ninjutsu, taijutsu, genjutsu, sage jutsu, Madara's in the top three. Assuming you're not including Otsutsuki's. But technically there is kind of a problem with your moveset being that wide. See, Madara is incredible at everything. I mean, he was supposed to be the final boss of Naruto. And because of this, his fireball jutsu is one of the greatest we've ever seen. He's able to rip meteors out of the sky. He was able to defeat a dual EMS Sasuke with no eyeballs using a sage mode he learned 35 seconds earlier. He could shoot purple lightning out of his fingertips like he was related to Rey Skywalker. Oh, did that hurt your feelings? I don't care. And therefore, when you consider the fact that Madara was so good at everything, it's hard to be like, oh, well, then he was clearly the best at something. But like, when it comes down to Taijutsu, how could you even argue with Madara being in the top three? Because, well, yes, during the war arc, Madara does a whole lot of everything. There's a scene where he uses the Great Fireball technique with so much tenacity that it requires an entire division of water release users to nullify it. And then after they do that, he just decides to make a bunch of meteors out of fireballs that end up killing thousands of people. He shoots laser beams out of his mouth and out of his fingers. So let's not forget about the way that the Fourth Great Shinobi World War opens for Madara. And that is just raw uncut knuckle sandwiches. Madara decides, even though he has the full ability of his Rinnegan from the second that he's reincarnated, to simply bum rush an entire division of Shinobi, 20,000 people. And you know what he does? He embarrasses every single one of them. Whether it's kicking people's heads into the sand or grabbing explosive tags off a kunai and slapping them onto somebody else or stealing swords and then becoming a Beyblade, Madara, without using any jutsu whatsoever, manages to make it very clear to the 20,000 shinobi facing him that they are outmatched. And the reason that Madara is able to do things like this is because he spent his entire life fighting against incredibly powerful shinobi. I mean, one of the least impressive things that Madara ever did was go to the Hidden Stone Village, smack the taste out of Mu and Anoki's mouths, and then just leave. And so while we don't know how he went about defeating these two, we can assume that a fair amount of taijutsu was involved. And considering the fact that Mu was the person who killed Kengetsu Hozuki, who went up against the entirety of the 4th Division ceiling team and told them how to beat them, and still wasn't defeated until Gara pulled up, and Anoki is the only person Madara identified is a possible threat to him in the fourth great shinobi world war that is very impressive but obviously it's less impressive than the fact that madara survived hundreds of battles against a man who was effectively immortal and while a lot of you are now probably asking the very logical question okay then why isn't the immortal on this list hashirama believe it or not is actually a kenjutsu user you know this is the scroll that he carried on his back actually held multiple massive swords and this makes sense we consider the fact that senju stands for 1000 tasks and therefore the senju were said to be talented at everything i would also argue that hashirama is more reliant on jutsus and his regeneration ability than his taijutsu, at least comparatively to Madara. And there's also the fact that Madara proclaimed that a person that he fought in the fourth great shinobi world war not named Hashirama was the greatest taijutsu fighter he had ever encountered. And that, ladies and gentlemen, was our number two spot because coming in at number two, we have Might Guy. Nick, how are you placing somebody who's proclaimed by Madara, arguably the most trustable voice on who's strong and who isn't, to be the strongest taijutsu user of all time, not at number one? Well, We'll get to that in a second. But for the moment, let's focus on Mike Guy. What do I really need to say about Mike Guy's Taijutsu ability that you don't already know? He's a master of the eight gates, being able to open all eight gates, which grants him access to moves like the Morning Peacock, a technique available to Mike Guy after he opens the sixth gate, where he punches the air so hard he's able to launch fireballs. And the fire generated by these punches is so intense that it was able to evaporate hundreds of water sharks from the likes of Kisame. Yes, that's right, with a technical type disadvantage, Mike 
white guy was able to outclass Kisame, the greatest water ninjutsu user in all of Naruto. However, if my guy happens to open to something like, oh, I don't know, the seventh gate, he's able to use an ability known as Daytime Tiger. By clapping his two hands together, he creates a pocket of super condensed pressure that he then pushes forward in a punch-like attack. This condensed pressure then travels in the form of a tiger that can explode on command. And the explosion of this attack is so large, it dwarfs that of the island turtle. That is to say that this purely taijutsu attack is above island level and has been shown all but destroying things like Madara Susano. But heaven forbid if you ever see Mike Guy open to the eighth gate, because in the eighth gate, he can use abilities like the evening elephant, a technique that allows Mike Guy to punch so hard he releases pressurized cones of air. He releases over and over again from all directions as he uses his newfound ability to jump through the air by kicking it so hard. These punches are so hard that they're able to shatter the likes of a truth seeker orb, something that shouldn't technically be possible. But Mike Guy's strongest move is undoubtedly his eighth gate technique, Night Guy. A technique where Mike Guy enters into a sprinter stance and uses his dynamic entry kick at such a speed and at such a weight that it bends space time, making it not only impossible to dodge, but also a guaranteed one hit kill against everybody who's not the final boss of Naruto. And considering the fact that Mike Guy, with Taijutsu alone and a little bit of help, was able to almost kill Madara, supposedly the final boss of Naruto, means when talking about the top Taijutsu users in all of Naruto, you can't ignore him. Now, obviously, sharing that spot with Mike Guy. Is Rock Lee, as there's genuinely no reason for us to believe that Rock Lee is any weaker than Mike Guy outside of the fact that we haven't seen Rock Lee open the eighth gate. However, Rock Lee has a couple of things that Mike Guy doesn't, like the drunken fist, which makes Rock Lee's taijutsu so unpredictable that people like Kimimaru, a natural born genius in all things hand to hand combat, was not only flustered, but also getting pressure. And while I've seen tons of impressive feats from Rock Lee, the most impressive feat we've ever seen from him is during Naruto the Last, where through the power of opening up to the sixth or seventh gate, he was able to kick a meteor in half. And while Rock Lee had the rest of his suicide corpse on his side, Rock Lee was leading the charge. So for that reason, Mike Guy and Rock Lee share the second spot. So who gets first, Nick? I'll give you a guess. What do I say every single time we do a video ranking some aspect of Naruto and what characters are good at it? Naruto is going to be first. However, when it comes to categorizations that Naruto is on top of, I would argue that Taijutsu is the one he has the biggest lead in. Because Naruto's Taijutsu is... God tier. Yes, obviously, Naruto has things like Rasengan and KCM 1 and 2 and his Kurama Chakra mode. It's actually just what KCM is. I just don't know what to call it when he's in like his... It's his tailed beast transformation, but that sounds boring. But at the core of Naruto's abilities, Taijutsu has always been the most important. This is why he uses the Rasengan, because the Rasengan is essentially just an extension of a fist. It's not until Naruto Shippuden that Naruto figures out any ranged abilities whatsoever. And yet Naruto finds himself on equal footing against the likes of Neji, Gara, and Sasuke, all in Taijutsu battles. Well, the fight against Gara is not a Taijutsu battle, but you get it. Using almost entirely Taijutsu, Naruto managed to battle against the likes of Sasuke, a Sharingan wielder, Neji, a Byakugan wielder, people for all intents and purposes that should be much better than him in Taijutsu. But really when it comes down to it, Naruto's most impressive Taijutsu feats come from Boruto and Naruto the Last. And we'll go chronologically. See, because while Naruto the Last definitely focuses more on like the lasery aspect of Naruto's fights, when it really comes down to it, Naruto's most decisive blows against Toneri are Taijutsu. Like when Naruto condenses the KCM2 mode into his arm and punches Toneri so hard, it knocks him out of Tenseigon mode. Do you know how hard you have to get punched to lose the Tenseigon? But really when it comes down to Naruto, quite literally running up the score on the competition when it comes to Taijutsu, we gotta look at fights against Momushiki and Ishiki. See, because in Naruto's battle against Momushiki, we saw for the first time in Boruto that he hadn't lost a step. In fact, in Naruto's battle against Fuse Momushiki, he in base form managed to completely outdo Momushiki in a battle of hand-to-hand -hand combat. And while Sasuke is definitely a factor in this battle, really when it comes down to it, the person putting the show on here was Naruto. The whooping that Naruto put on Momushiki pales in comparison to the one he put on Ishiki. The second that Naruto activated Baryon mode, all bets were off. The good man in Naruto left the moment that Naruto and Kurama decided to collide Chakra, as Ishiki, an entity supposedly stronger than Jigen, who managed to rip Naruto and Sasuke out of their respective Chakra mechs, was absolutely drowning in punches against this version of Naruto. In fact, in Baryon mode, Naruto was explicitly told by Kurama to not use Jutsu, and so he didn't. All he used was home and defense. I stole that joke from Danny. And he showed Ishiki 
what human power can truly look like, very much cementing himself as the greatest taijutsu user in all of Naruto. And now, while technically Kawaki and Boruto should probably be on this list, especially after the most recent anime fight, I'm trying to stick to Naruto characters here, because that's what the vast majority of my fan base wants. But based off current powers and what they're able to pull off, I would argue that Naruto and Kawaki exist somewhere in the three to four spot on this list. And now you know. But what do you guys think? Who do you think are the greatest Taijutsu users in all of Naruto? Tell me in the comments below. And while you guys are down there, please, for me, like this video, subscribe to the page, and hit that noti bell. Oops. We went big long on this video. It's gonna be like the first 45 minute video I posted on this page in a while. Sorry, Cody.